now live. Uh, so, hello everybody, and welcome to episode six, I think it is, of the Film Monkey's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, hello, James. Hello, Neil. Hello there. Hello, um, Simon and Neil. Hello, hello. Um, well, thanks, Neil, for uh, for coming along and um, and doing this with us. It's, it's very much appreciated. Yeah. Thank oh, you you're so much. welcome. And it's it's a it's a great way to spend okay. lockdown. So. <laughs> <laughs> it gives us all make, something make to some do. Make some use of it. Yeah, yeah make some use of it. Good. <laughs> um, so let's get stuck in. We've got me and James have written thousands of questions for you <laughs> um, so, because we we have we have been diehard fans for quite a few years. Uh, and as we were talking just before we went live, we did a Predator short. Um, so we are creature feature fans, um, and and so you're you're kind of like one of our our heroes in a way. Um, but I'll let, I'll let James... I love a good monster movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was indeed. Right but uh, James, well, if, you wanna, if you want to start off with the questions um, that we, yeah, we have I, lined up. I guess a good one to start with, was, um, Neil, was what inspired you when you was a young boy to want to start directing films? Any films in particular that stood out for you that just changed, just changed your mind on yeah. everything? I mean, I've, 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 yeah, I think I probably said it in a number of interviews before that um, you know, there's. It was kind of two films in a way. There was first of all, of all there was I saw Star Wars for the first time when I was like seven, seven or eight, I think it was, and that got me completely into the cinema and movies and going to the movies to see them. But then it wasn't until I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark and and specifically seeing Raiders and the making of Raiders on TV. Uh, shortly afterwards, I think it was, um, as, as a promotional thing, uh, that I, I, I came out of that and I knew exactly what I had to do with my life. It was like, I, you know, Raiders just inspired me as a movie. The making of Raiders was like watching Spielberg and watching everybody do that. It was like I suddenly understood what it was. So I understood what directing was. And I was like, that's what I have to do. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but that's what I have to do. Yeah. And, and it began like, there, really. And, and, um, uh, a, a very uh, close friend of mine, uh, Mike Johnson, who has since gone on to like write Sherlock Holmes and and a whole bunch of other stuff. He's a brilliant screenwriter. Uh, we we were both kind of inspired at the same time, and his mom had a Super 8 Sony camera. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, is now it's become such a sort of cliche now with a lot of these you know, filmmakers, including Spielberg, that you know we all started making mini epics on Super 8 in the in the 80s. Um, so I was like, you know, 12 years old, we were making films and learning the process. You know, you shoot on this, this tiny little film gauge, you know, and, uh, and send it off to the, the lab and it comes back and you've got to edit it by hand and you've got to edit the actual film. Uh, you know, we were doing things like scratching on the film, like animating laser blasts and stuff on the actual film with a needle using a, like a magnifying glass and stuff like that to try and add lightning coming out of people's fingers and, and weird stuff like that. Uh, and doing lots of practical physical effects, I was like trying. I was doing a lot of miniature effects, trying to do sort of squib hits and just you know, everything that we've we'd seen. We wanted to try and emulate. Um, so yeah, so we, that, that's what we were kind of doing as teenagers. We were making did, movies and causing trouble that way. Did you find that like um, it actually helped you? Because I same same with me. I got the the parents' camera. And we had to just press record and stop to do the editing in the camera because it was VHS when I was messing around. But it sort of helped you at the early stage sort of learn about editing, really. You know, like what shots to use. You didn't have any chance to do it again. It was like one, one attempt scenario, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, the only way to learn it is to do it and to make the mistakes and, you know, learn from those mistakes. So, uh, but yeah, splicing any film by hand and taping it together or gluing it together and dealing with all that kind of stuff certainly makes you like very precious about where your cut's going to be because it's kind of a one-time only deal um so yeah no that was that was a great way to learn and um we we noticed obviously that uh, in a lot of your films um you've sort of had a, a theme shall we say of, of creatures and, and horror and practical effects as well um are these the sort of themes that you always kind of strive to include in your in your work? Like, is there is there something in your head that you're always like, this is what I am, and this is what I want to put out for for each thing, or, or are you always trying to do something different? Um, 
I think so. I mean, I think I, I, I like to try different things, but my, you know, my, the, my big love has always been monsters and action movies, and you know, the two things combined and things like that. Hence, you know, Predator. Um, so, uh, but around that time, because not only was I inspired by Raiders or whatever, but you know, American Werewolf and The Howling and The Thing and all these movies with incredible physical effects and creatures, uh, and Predator after that as well. Um, and I'd seen Alien for the first time, and just uh, so I just totally fell in love with these these creatures and horror, and wanting to, to incorporate them in my movies. And it's 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 a lot of fun. I mean, creating iconic monsters is incredible amounts of fun yeah. if you can do it. Um, and <laughs> the process of doing it and dressing people up in suits and things like that it's it's just a lot of fun. I think those those are the same things that right. got into my head and made me do uh, model making and, and special effects and prosthetics and stuff when I was you know, at uni and doing all that. It was well, just those lovely creatures. Yeah, I was creatures. inspired by, you know, reading about ILM and what they were doing. Yeah. You know, I, I, got, I, I my most precious possession at the time was I managed to get hold of the ILM book that they, they produced. And, you know, everything from it that they did, like map paintings and miniatures and creature effects was like, I was obsessed with it and just wanting to make movies with all that stuff in it yeah. as much as possible. So, you know, it seemed like my first feature ended up having creatures and miniature effects and things in it so yeah. yeah which leads us nicely on to dog soldiers which was your first film which is a classic i think everyone loves dog soldiers and loads of comments about it so how did that come about for your first feature film i mean was it difficult to get off the ground or did you have like some short yeah, films was that helped you? well i mean through, throughout the uh so i guess this would be the 90s um i i i went to film school um up in newcastle and when I graduated from the, from there, I spent the next eight years as, working as an editor because um, that was kind of it was a way in. Uh, and I edited my for my graduation movie. I made like a twenty minute uh, zombie movie. Um, oh. and it was a <laughs> comedy zombie movie. Uh, it was like before Brain Dead, before Shaun of the Dead. I was making comedy zombie movies, and um, uh, people came along to see it. And uh, some people from the industry came to see it, and they. Uh, they offered me a job as an editor off the back of that, and uh, so I so I started editing. But at the same time, I was writing, and at the same time, I was trying to become a director by doing short films or whatever I could get, uh, working on some other films. Um, we did. I, I was involved in a in a, a a movie that was shot up in Newcastle in 1995. It was kind of like all our friends and anybody that we knew in the industry all kind of ganged together and did this thing for free. Yeah. Uh, pretty much um and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong and it was just like it was a, it was so many disasters but we did it like we managed to achieve it i kind of co-wrote it and edited it and did some action coordinating on it and yeah, everybody liked it about five jobs um it ended up being a bloody awful film but you know that's how you learn <laughs> you know if you learn from your mistakes and then yeah that was that was a pretty awful mistake i don't even know if you could find it anywhere now uh but um as an experience that learned a lot. And, and so I was sat on set with uh, the production coordinator, a guy called Keith Bell, who I went to film school with. And uh, we just sat there and we said, I think that we can do this and we can do it better and we can do it where everybody gets paid. Um, we just need to come up with something. So that was in 1995. I wrote the first draft of Dog Soldiers in 96, I think. Uh, and, you know, and, and it was that simple concept of like, uh, what about soldiers versus werewolves? I mean, Perfect. clearly inspired by the likes of Predator, but also mm. it's like, well, Predator meets American Werewolf in London. What, what, what would that be? So <laughs> it, it's like soldiers versus werewolves. And let's make it a British film and make it like the ultimate post-pub movie. That's what I wanted it to be, that people will come home from the pub and watch Dog Soldiers because it's, it's just going to be full of swearing and violence and, and all kinds of fun stuff. Good time. Um, yeah. And... It then took us like six years to get the to get the money together to do it. Um, so it took, took a while. We eventually found um, a, a spinach magnate from Arkansas. Uh, this guy whose family uh, made their fortune on canned spinach, Popeyes canned spinach. All right, amazing. And he, uh, yeah, this guy called David Allen, and he um, had always wanted to produce movies and it, it, for some whatever reason I don't, I don't know why he'd always wanted to make a werewolf movie and he came along to the american film market and saw the stand that our sales agents had with the script we had this beautiful like uh, a maquette uh 
of a werewolf that that we designed, oh, and yeah. some artwork and things like that. And he just said, "Okay, I want to, I want to, I want to finance this movie." And so he put his own money in. We went off to Luxembourg and shot it there. And they, there was a Luxembourg Film Fund at the time, um, and yeah, and that's how we eventually did it. And so we shot it in two thousand and one. I remember seeing yeah. it in the cinema. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> and it was yeah, it, it kind of blew my mind, and I think resonated me resonated with me for a long time. Yeah, Definitely. yeah. I went with all my oh, mates. Awesome. We, all, we all we all got together and went to the pub. I mean, the poster and the trailer we were sold in. We went there and had a great time. Loved it. Yeah, I was kind of, um, with the trailers and things like that, I was trying to kind of imitate the, do you remember the, the army soldier adverts that were on yeah. in cinemas? Um, yeah, I was trying to, uh, some of the trailers anyway were like imitators of that and things like that. I just really wanted to play into that. But it was, you know, it, it really, we got a great team behind it with Pathé, who, um, I don't know when they bought it, but after we shot it, whatever, I know Pathé like came in and said, okay, we're going to buy the movie and we're going to give it a big release in the UK. And we never dreamed that that was going to happen, but it was just perfect. And they really got behind it and sold it well. Yeah, because that's, that's the thing, isn't it? Sometimes you can go and make a film. It's, just, it's hard enough getting the money to make the film. And then after you've made it, then you, you don't know if it's how well it's going to be distributed in certain countries. And it's kind of just, you know, fingers crossed, isn't it, really, sometimes? Well, yeah, making the film is only half the battle. Yeah. You know, actually getting it seen is, is a, an equal, equally difficult uh, struggle in its own right. And a, and a difficult one because you, you have less control over that. It's like at least with the making yeah. of it, you have some degree of, you know, it's it's, it's you making the mistakes or whatever or, or not yeah. making mistakes, but it's, it's in your hands. Whereas distribution is kind of taken out of your hands and it's in yeah. the lap of the movie gods. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's whatever happens happens isn't it it's yeah. a bit scary <laughs> yeah and, and there's so many kind of like you know finite th- elements that what can affect that is you know, if you get the wrong poster or the wrong trailer that gives the the wrong impression about the film it's like that can deeply affect who will go and see it i mean these things really matter yeah um so in terms of like the release of that and and how well it was received i mean it's it's pretty much cult hit now i'd say but like in terms it, of how did it kind of from then on how did it help progress your career and, and lead eventually into doing your next film the descent well um it, it allowed me to uh I, I i was lucky enough to have an agent by this point already but uh, based on my writing work but um it allowed me to meet up with other production companies and things like that in london and through that i was introduced to um Celador films who was um, run by Paul Smith and uh, Christian Coulson. It was a very, very small uh, company, but they had money because Celador, Celador Television had created, like, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And, like, had massive global success with that. Um, but Celador Films were just getting started, and they'd just done one feature film already. I can't remember what it was. But uh, so I met with Christian, and he said, okay, we've seen Dog Shoulders. We love it. What do you want to do next? Uh, and I pitched him this zombie movie that uh, basically a feature version of my graduation film so zombies on an oil rig it's all kind of like and it's kind of huge and he said okay i love it but we can't afford it it's just way too big so um why don't, why don't you go away and come up with something else and this was like i was still living up in the northeast of england at the time and i'd, so I'd taken the train down to london for this meeting and i got on the train back and literally, on the, by the time I stepped off the train in, in Newcastle, I'd come up with the idea for the descent. I was like, okay, people go down a cave, whatever. And then uh, it kind of went from there. So I went back to him with a pitch or a treatment or whatever for the descent. And he said, okay, that's, this is perfect. We'll do this. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll do it. So what happened right. with the, the oil rig thing? <laughs> uh, that kind of died a death. I mean, okay. it's, it's somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes. I, I, I'm determined to make a zombie film some point. But uh, I don't know if it'll be that one, but I definitely would like to make a zombie film at some point. Get it out of my system. And the undead yeah. in Game of Thrones don't count. <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't really deal with them very much in my episodes. So. No, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with the descent, it was like a full-on horror monster movie, um, different from Dog Soldiers. They didn't have any of the humour. Was that like a conscious decision that you wanted to do just a straight horror? to maybe be seen as a more serious filmmaker or was it just just because of the way the story evolved i, I don't think i don't think that um it had to be 
it didn't have anything to do with being wanting to be taken more seriously as a filmmaker. Because I think you know, like it, it, comedy films have their merits as well. So it's it's not about that. But it was about a challenge that I can't remember who it was. Some critic of Dog Soldiers said that they liked it, but when was a British filmmaker going to make a really scary horror movie again? And I kind of thought, oh, that's kind of throwing the gauntlet down a bit. Um, all right, what can we do? And so it was a decision to sort of go to a much darker place with uh, the descent. And also, like, you know, I was equally inspired in terms of like horror films. I was equally inspired by like Evil Dead Two as I was with The Thing. And they're very, very different kind of films. But so if Dog Soldiers fall, f- fell into the Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two kind of category, then The Descent would firmly fall into Alien and The Thing and yeah. Exorcist and whatever. Just like you know, really dark stuff with very little. I mean, there is some very small you know comic relief in there but there's there's certainly it's not comedy like dog soldiers is because i I see dog soldiers as some people find it very scary but i kind of find it more funny than scary yeah perfect i said evil did too that's the perfect kind of category you could put it into yeah 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 so that was the plan make make it make it as scary as hell it was great so well in terms of obviously you didn't I mean, how like how much was on location and how much was set built? Because again, that was still you know similarish sort of budget to Dog Soldiers. Um, you know, how difficult was it creating that those creatures? You know, with the performance artists and 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 building the sets. Um, well, I mean, there isn't a single real cave in the movie. Yeah. Uh, so everything is either miniatures or sets or matte paintings. Um, we figured out because we we went caving like as a sort of research trip. Like me and the cast went caving together down up in um, right. York or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But only I came back. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, but, but what was really apparent from that was like we can't do this in caves. There's just no way. Yeah. You know, people will die. Um, <laughs> it's just it's just it just became hugely impractical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. That 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 idea went out the window very quickly. Also, it was like, how are we going to find caves that are going to fit exactly what we need in the story? Yeah. Um, and the story was very clearly designed about what that cave was, where it went. So anyway, so uh, our fantastic production designer Simon Bowles came in and, and and proposed a way to build them using this kind of foam structure, which was going to save us some money but make them kind of strong and rigid. And also, what we did was was because of the way I was going to shoot it. Um, it was going to be very dark, which allowed us to use the same caves again and again and again. And all we yeah. did was like literally like either repaint them a little bit or move a boulder here or a boulder there, or in some cases like just turn them around or something. And they were kind of interconnecting caves, so you could like put one that way or that way. It's like it. Uh, he he built I think it was like six or seven sets in total, but in the film it looks like it was about twenty four. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know. It was just reusing and reusing and reusing. Um, and we got away with that by the, the, the technique that we decided on. And that was like me and Simon and, and Sam McCurdy, the DP, uh, I, I sat down and I said, I don't want any light in those caves that isn't taken in by one of the characters. There should be no, we're not lighting the caves to look beautiful. We're not going to have beautiful shafts of light going anywhere. Yeah. It's like it's whatever the characters take with them. It could be flares, lighters, torches, whatever, but that's it. And we have to. I had. To, I had to plan the script around that, so to make sure that everybody had some form of light source with them. Yeah. And in some cases, it was nice to have like some characters have like a green snap light. Some one character has orange fire. Yeah. Another character has a blue torch. So it gives it almost color codes the characters, which helps you define where you are at any point. Yeah. There was a lot of planning went into it as far as the story goes, and we shot it in linear order as well because it is like a, it's a very linear journey through the cave. Um, so we went off to Scotland. I think we did like two weeks or a week or something on location, which is just all the exteriors uh, up and up, up near Perth, and um, and then we're in, we were in Pinewood uh, for the rest. And uh, it was funny because it was in January and there weren't heated studios, so it was absolutely freezing and everything. We were constantly um, spraying the, the sets and the actors and everything was just constantly raining inside the sets. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you know, they they suffered, they suffered a lot. <laughs> so was it a bit of a tough shoot then, or? It was, and physically it was absolutely. Um, there was there was a lot of stunts. There was a lot of um, 
I say it's just, you know, we had to risk the actors getting hypothermia all the time. They were coming off set and wrapping up in thermal blankets and stuff like that to keep dry. But it was, uh, yeah, it was physically it was tough. Well, they took the, a beat. The entrance, <clears throat> the entrance to the cave, wasn't that a matte painting? Or was when they come down? Uh, there is. There's a shot that kind of cranes over the top of them, which yeah. is a matte painting. Right, yeah, uh, and then there's a, a, a we, we, um, Lee took. Yeah, I, work, big, I used to work with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Built this fantastic miniature. miniature. It was like yeah. a fifteen foot high cave interior, and uh, we had like a waterfall made of salt. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. They used to do. Down. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. There's the old salt shoot it at a thousand frames, and then it looks like water. Yeah, um, uh, it was amazing, brilliant. Yeah, they don't. Really good. They don't do it like now, nah, like how they used to. Unfortunately, um, I know. <laughs> which no. I think I think it's kind of changed quite a lot. Um, in terms of regard to that that sort of side of things but um was it um after your two oh actually james i'll let you ask this ask this next question actually okay uh yeah well so after the, the descent as well that was also very well received did that help open the door then for you for making like bigger budget films because i know you went on you did doomsday is your next film wasn't it did you yeah. was that the next film you had planned or was there other films you was trying to make and didn't happen um I'm trying to remember back now. I think I think that was I had a number of ideas, and I think that because of the success of the descent, both here, uh, both in the UK and in the US, um, and the sort of you know, I guess I got I got both like kind of critical acclaim, and and it was a financial success as well. That that definitely opened a ton of doors, and there were people, uh, you know, especially in Hollywood, over wanting to make something with me. And I proposed Doomsday to them. I had this. I pitched it over the phone to uh, Rogue Pictures. And uh, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. And so it suddenly it became, you know, it was a much much bigger budget film and uh, a very different kind of film. It wasn't horror, but it's certainly full of blood and guts. Um, but it, it was going to be my kind of homage to eighties movies. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah definitely. <laughs> I think I think it was kind of ahead of its time a bit, you know. Maybe maybe because you know, like. It, um, uh, what's it called grindhouse or whatever came out afterwards and and things like drive and stuff like that came along but yeah. um yeah now this was it was my homage to vhs and and you know, you know rental stores of the 80s <laughs> yeah i mean yeah like, like i said like stranger things everyone it's all it's all the things everybody's do doing it now yeah <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it was just like i don't know like 15 years too early or whatever <laughs> yeah and, and you know and obviously th- th- that that had an impact on the movie and um and, and I think it's also down to the, you know, say the marketing is really important, that it wasn't marketed very well, certainly not in the US. Uh, I don't think they quite got the sense of humor of it um, and just marketed it as like a straight action movie. Um, and it didn't, it just didn't really find its audience then or there. And it, it, it has since. I get more and more people now telling me that, you know, they're, they're Doomsday fans, which is great to hear. But it was a kind of a wake-up call for me as a director as well, because I had a lot of luck and uh you know with dog soldiers descent i was kind of on a run and then this one came along on doomsday it was like well the critics hated it and it didn't do that well and it was like okay so i i learned a lot i learned a lot from that experience yeah, it's not, not like a bad film it's a good film it's an enjoyable film like i said it's got some good action moments, I, have, so. yeah, I had an absolute blast making it yeah I bet. Uh, you know having that much money to all those toys that much money to play with Doing big action movie down in Cape Town, blowing stuff up, car chases, all sorts of stuff like that, machine guns, explosions. It was it was a lot of fun to do. Um, so I, you know, I I don't have any regrets about it because it's like I'm glad I made it and I'm glad it's out there. I'm proud of it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, but I said, but I did learn from how it was, you know, how it was received and how uh, audiences responded to it for sure. Do you think um, <clears throat> just because like you know, there's a lot of films made in England um, and, you know, the English go and film in other countries, um, you know, like Budapest and Bucharest and loads of other places now. So do you think um, in terms of like the market, do you think a film has to do, I mean, back then, obviously you were in Eng- living in England, but like, do you think it's more important to try and do what, better in America than it is in England? Or the, where do you think sort of the market lies in terms of, Trying to, trying to make it as a director, if you see what I mean. If you're um, just starting out for sex. I don't know. I think the rest of the world, the rest of the world has opened. It used to be that, like you know, it was like just that. about North America, right. and now the rest of the world has opened up as a huge market, which is uh, you know is bigger than North America. So, hmm. 
it, it all depends. It's like because you can have a film that doesn't do well in North America but could clean up in the rest of the world, yeah. uh, or in a market you wouldn't expect, like it might do really well in China or something like that, and then um, then it becomes a hit. And you know, you know, money money talks as as far as a lot of the industry is concerned. Mm. So and especially now with Netflix and Amazon, you know, you can you you don't necessarily have to have a market. You know, you can just sort of. If they buy into it and then they're sort of a part of it, they're the ones who decide. Where well, so, to put yeah, it. so much as far as distribution is concerned, like so much has changed yeah. over the yeah. past, you know, since I started out. You know, it was kind of theatrical and then DVDs back then. Yeah. You know, and now that market's gone, and yeah. we've got to figure out a way how it how it also benefits the filmmakers as much. But you know, it's, you know, I swear I had Dog Soldiers on VHS. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> DVD. Maybe I think it was VHS. I don't know. <laughs> it could have been. It could yeah. well have been. Um, but yeah, but, but now it's like because these other avenues are open to filmmakers and they need material. Amazon, Netflix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it's 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 a great forum for films because more people are ever going to see them than probably would see them in the cinema. Um, people at home now have you know a lot of them have their big TVs and their surround sounds or whatever, so they're seeing it in a pretty good kind of quality and you know getting the most out of it. Um, and it's as I say, the, the beast needs feeding. You know, these these um, the streamers and such like they need material, they need films. Um, it, whereas with it cinema, it's like cinema yeah. is like a you know nobody had to release a movie in the cinema, but these these things need they need new content or they will die. Yeah. So we got to keep on making films for them. Yeah. And I still miss the days of cinema movies though. Oh, you know, hopefully they're still <laughs> going to have loads of indie films coming out in cinema because. You can't be I hope so too. No, I, I hope so too. I mean, it's, you know, it's 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 kind of a choice of how you watch your movies, but nothing, nothing beats the cinema experience when when it's good. Yeah. Um, when when it clicks and you're sh you're having that shared experience with an audience, it's yeah. it's amazing. It's unique, and it, and we cannot let that die. We cannot let that just go by the wayside. Yeah. Um, and I don't think people want to either. I think people love that when it when it comes together. The trouble is, is that there's quite a lot of bad films that come along, and then that kind of kills the cinema experience because there's nothing like watching a bad film in the cinema, um, yeah. especially when it costs so much. But when you get when you when you strike you know strike gold at the cinema, it is it's it's bordering on religious. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, um, you beat it every time. Yeah, um, I was just going to ask about um, your relationship with your cinematographer, your DOP. So. Um, Sam McCurdy, he he worked on um, pretty much what well, most of your films, weren't they? Or at least uh, the yeah, Descent he, and uh, Dog Soldiers. Yeah, Dog, he did. Well, he did the Dog. Uh, he did Dog Soldiers, Descent, uh, Doomsday, Centurion. Um, he did my game, my first Game of Thrones yeah. with me. He did uh, Lost in Space with me. Um, yeah. So uh, how right. how have you found that? Have you kind of you've obviously worked with other cinematographers over the course of other features. Um, and I TV. have now since yeah. like kind of working in the TV space or whatever, sure. like because you, you're getting different DPs each time. Uh, for my latest feature, Sam wasn't available, so I used this fantastic DP called Luke Ryan. Um, he's just he's done the most amazing job with like so little resources and you know. Um, but um, yeah, so it's it's different every time. The thing with with, with Sam was or certainly for those first four films, it wasn't just Sam; it was Simon Bowles. You know, my production designer was on all four films as well, yeah. and I, you know, I try and keep. If I find you know somebody that's amazing, I want to try and keep them with me. Um, but you know, it's, it's a question of availability. Like you know, certain like a, a great first AD like I had on The Descent wasn't available on Centurion or whatever. So you know, you you end up using other people. But there's so many talented, you know, crew members out there that uh, there's there's plenty out there to find, and it's it's. Sometimes it's, it can be limiting just to stick to one person all the time. Yeah, yeah you, know, do you want to just try different relationships or different, um, different DPs, different production designers. Uh, but then you know, it's just nice. To, it's also just nice to be working with your mates, which yeah. is a real <laughs> bonus. So I guess you don't uh, want to risk. You don't want to um, start a new relationship and then it's it doesn't really work. You're during filming and then you're like, well, we're here now. Um, but I guess with TV, yeah, you're kind tough. of paired up together and you don't really sometimes have a choice. That's tough. Bit. I mean, it's not so bad on a TV project because it's quicker, you know. But on, on a movie, it's like, yeah, you don't want to make those mistakes. So I mean, you try and vet everybody as carefully as possible and mm. hang out with them as much as possible because for me, it's more. It, well, it's as much about what their, their abilities is as, as as 
you know, just what they're like as a person because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them on set and whatever. So you better get along. <laughs> so it does make it difficult if you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day one, you're like, oh, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, you don't want you don't want someone who's like extremely talented but also a tit. You yeah. kind of want them to be both extremely talented and awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. likes a drink down the pub. <laughs> exactly. So, it, I mean, we've it's talked, a good gauge. <laughs> we've touched on um, on well, Game of Thrones, and you've you've kind of brought that up that um, Sam worked on that with you, but. Yeah, and when you when you 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 was that your kind of first foray into TV and it um, was yeah and you and, I mean that's quite a massive kind of undertaking it was one of the you did two of the you know biggest sort of episodes yeah, and battles <laughs> of Game of Thrones um, it was a huge it was kind of nuts yeah. yeah it was um, how did that come about so yeah the, the Battle of Blackwater was my first ever TV job yeah and, um, it came out of the blue it was like I got a it's I got a than phone Emmerdale, call from, wasn't it? I mean. It's definitely better than Emmerdale. <laughs> Although, you know, I wouldn't mind doing the battle episode of Emmerdale. Maybe sometimes. not, you know, yeah. <laughs> that would be great. The zombies, yeah. The battle of Emmerdale Farm. Um, yeah. yeah, I got a phone call out of the blue one, one Saturday morning uh, from the producers of Game of Thrones. And I had actually been, like, I, I had my agent approach them and said, I'd love to direct an episode. But they were kind of very much, it's HBO, it's kind of closed shop. We have our group of directors that we use all the time. Mm. And Neil's never done any TV. He's only ever done films. So it was like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, and then they were shooting season two, and I got a phone call out of the blue on Saturday morning uh, from the producers saying, "Would you like to come and direct an episode?" Um, we've lost our, you know, our, our we've lost our director like the last minute, um, and we need somebody. And we were on set, and um, so so what had happened was um, off the back of Centurion, which is the movie I made after Doomsday. Uh, a lot of the crew from that, uh, including um, um, Paul Herbert, the stunt coordinator, and uh, Camilla Napru, the horse master, went on to Game of Thrones. And when they lost the director, they kind of those two kind of went up to the producers and said, "You should give Neil a call. Like he knows how to do battles. He knows how to do battles on a budget and fast. You should give him a call." So they did. They gave me a call, and and it was like, "Do you want to come and direct an episode of Game of Thrones?" It was like, "Absolutely, one hundred percent." When does it start? Next month? Month after? Uh, no, you start Monday morning, uh, oh. and you've got a week's prep, uh, and then we're into it. And uh, and I was like, "Okay, I think I better watch all the others because I'd never even seen the whole series by that point." So I had to I had to watch the entire season on Sunday, and it was on a flight at like six o'clock in the morning on the Monday, and and start work in Belfast on nine o'clock Monday morning, and. Um, yeah, it was it was a crazy week, but we and, we got and there. A week's notice, and it's the biggest episode they've ever made. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, uh, but I kind of, I don't know. I something about that. I I really kind of embrace the scale of it. The big the big. I really like the big stuff. I like yeah, epic oh, yeah. filmmaking. So, you, so. I mean, how, how do you approach something like that? Are you kind of just playing with little miniature figures to try and you know, like you would a car chase. You, we had, uh, yeah, we had some the we, and, production designers provide a lot of uh, sets, you know, miniature sets, like models of sets, of course, yeah. um, and those are really useful for just planning actions and things like that around. Uh, but it was a lot of just having a great support team around you. I mean, the, the Game of Thrones team was really, really supportive and really, really welcoming, and um, uh, having a great AD, having a great, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to take Sam with me because it was such short notice. They just said, it's going to save us a lot of bother if you just bring a DP that you've worked with before. So I took Sam and, right. um, and, and it was just like spending that entire week just going over things again and again and again. This is what's going to happen. We had to design a bunch of stuff. Like it was one of the things that happened. I sat down with the writers and they are like, they are two of the most talented writers working today. They are brilliant at drama, at story, at character, all kind of stuff. What they're not so brilliant at is uh, battle strategy. Um, you know, but that's fair enough. They're not required to be. Um, I'm, also, I'm, I'm, aside from a filmmaker, I'm a student of military history and such like. I'm, I'm really interested in battles and strategy and such like. So what I kind of brought to the table was a sense of strategy to the Battle of Blackwater because as it was written in the script, it was like 40,000 guys jumping off a boat and going attacking a door. And like, you know, so that's, that's like the first 20 guys are busy doing something with the door. What are the rest of them doing? Just standing around, yeah. waiting. Uh, so, so, so it was like, no, we've got to have the, – they've got to bring battering rams. They've got to bring ladders. They've got to bring grappling hooks. They've, got to, you know, they've all got to be attacking everywhere at once. 
Uh, and I designed a, a, a boat, like a rowing boat, that when it lands, it could be turned upside down and used like a sort of tortoise shell to hide who was under it. And that goes up to the, the gate and it has a battering ram that is in a swing underneath it. Um, so, and they built it like within the week they built it and it, we made it work. Um, and the stuff like that was just great fun. Just planning like, okay, so what's this, like what is Stannis and his army trying to do? Okay, let's plan that. What are, what are, you know, Tyrion and his lot on the walls, what are they trying to do and plan that? And then just, you know, work them in opposition to each other. Hmm. So, so that's, you know, that's very much kind of what, what I brought to it. And then the same with the Battle of Blackwater later on was we, um, not Battle of Blackwater, the Castle Black battle later on. Um, but yeah, so it was a crazy week, but we did it. So, so leading on to the, the, yeah, the next episode you did, did they give you like a lot more creative control because you sort of proven yourself now in that second episode, that first episode? Yeah. Um, they were, they were always so open to ideas. There was, um, I don't, I don't know that they gave me more creative control. I suppose they did. And they, 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 I guess they just, you know, were responsive to my ideas um, which was great. I, mean, I had, I was, you know, I was blessed with having four weeks of prep on that one, and I needed it because it was like much more visual effects heavy and dealing with things like a, a giant mammoth, which you know was is a hundred percent CG. So, uh, except for the guy riding it, who, uh, it became very very complicated. We were using full CG mammoths, motion control, all kinds of things. It's one of the biggest green screens I've ever seen for to represent the wall and things like that. Um, and so we did. We needed those four weeks, but they were they allowed me to, like, one of the problems that was faced in that story was the idea that all the guys on top of the wall, if you don't know how well you know it, but all the guys on top of the wall, it's five hundred feet up or something like that. Yeah. Uh, John Snow and everybody there, they're completely out of danger. There's nothing can get to them up there. Yeah. Um, and so I suggested that what if the giants also had bows? And they're like they're the equivalent of like heavy artillery in the army, like because the regular bows they can only shoot like 300 feet or something, but with the giants their bows can like shoot 500 feet, and so suddenly they can pick people off the wall. And from that sprung the idea of well, what if a giant shoots a guy and he flies off the wall and he lands in the middle of Castle Black during the fight, and it kind of like geographically ties it all in together of what's happening. And then, and then and the other big one was. Um, as soon as I walked onto the set of Castle Black in this quarry in, in Northern Ireland, it struck me as like it's very flat and boring in the middle, but around the outside, it's like it's all gantries and walkways and buildings and walls, and that's the interesting stuff. So I thought, well, what if you just stuck a camera crane in the middle and we do something that takes in all the outside? And that's why I kind of came up with this 360 shot of following all the characters all the way around uh, the, the outside of Castle Black as the battle went on. Hmm. Um, and it became this one hour and it was it was non-script there was nothing like it in the script it was just okay I have this idea and they said okay go for it and so you know we had half a day and we did that shot in there and it's it 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 ties the whole battle and all the characters together in one shot um, yeah, it works really well but it was, it was yeah it was just like there needed to be just a justification for the shot and, uh, and we got that hmm. and um, it was good and that, that was kind of you know, they, they definitely indulged me on that one, but it paid off. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Great. Two great episodes. Yeah. Really <laughs> I'm really pleased. I mean, just to be part of something that that incredible and so that impactful, you know, it's part of... It's one of the biggest part of culture shows now. ever, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, even in terms of, you know, just movie making, let alone TV world, you know, it's it's a huge, huge program. Um, it's it's astonishing it really is what they what they achieved was astonishing and uh yeah i'm really proud to have been a small small cog in that particular show that's for sure yeah um just and, and some questions in terms of um your um so basically after after you're nomin emmy nominated for the yeah. uh, game of thrones uh episodes um you then have moved sort of a little bit more into tv um, was that kind of um, organic or were you kind of like, oh, I can get a little bit more of this kind of, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there kind of thing? Um, so because you've obviously worked on Westworld and Lost in Space. Um, what are your like, what are your preferences towards it? I mean, is there a, what are your positives and negatives to, towards the TV world, shall we say? 
Uh, do you well, like the, the short term? Yeah, I mean, a, a, a couple of a couple of things has happened. One was that that my kind of sources of financing in the UK had kind of dried up. That Salador Films had, had um, decided to give up filmmaking. They they'd peaked with Slumdog Millionaire and it was like kind of quit while you were ahead. So so they decided not to finance film movies anymore. And Pathé, who were involved with Descent, Dog Soldiers, and such like, and Centurion, um, they weren't really getting into film production and things anymore either. So um, it was kind of like, okay. And then through uh, Game of Thrones, got me into the TV space. So actually off the back of the first Game of Thrones, I went on to do Black Sails, and then right. I went on to do a couple of things, and then went back to do Game of Thrones two years later for the second episode. But by that time, I was you know, doing a whole bunch of stuff in the TV space and really enjoying it, and I'd moved to the, the States because of it. Right. Um, yeah. And I think what I love about it is, A, that you know, it's part, there's, there's been a huge revolution in television over the past 10, 15 years. Just to be a part of that going forward um, and getting to work on shows like Game of Thrones, Black Sails. I mean, if I hadn't worked on Black Sails, it's highly unlikely I ever would have got to do a pirate movie. You know? sure, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I got to do pirates. I got to do, you know, uh, Black Sails. Uh, uh, I got to do uh, uh, with with Game of Thrones, and I got to do a Western with Westworld. I got to yeah. do sci-fi with Lost in Space, and you could do these like three or four of these within the space of a year. And it's kind of like okay, if it was a feature, you're doing one thing, and it's two years, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. So I like that variety. I like jumping from project to project. I like the with working in TV, you kind of park your ego at the door because you you're not there to service your own vision it's somebody else's vision it's the writer or the showrunner yeah. or whatever it's somebody else's yeah. creation and you're there to service that and so the you know once you once you've parked your ego at the door it's like okay i'm there to do the best job possible but it's not my baby it's somebody else's baby and if that's yeah. fine and you do the best job possible um but you don't get quite so you don't lose quite so much sleep over it as you do yeah. on a feature um, you know, you can kind of switch off. You go home at night and you kind of switch off a little bit, but then, you know, you're full on next day at work. Um, how, how do you, and it's, how do you it's find just that? a different approach. Yeah, because obviously, like like you said, it's you, you as a writer, director yourself, you know, you, you like with, say, with Dog Soldiers, you know, you have the concept, you write it, you direct it, yeah. you oversee the post and everything, um, and it's your thing from start to finish, with obviously a, a show like, like Lost in Space or Game of Thrones, you know, the, uh, and there's, they say there's ten episodes, and you're doing you know episodes four, five, and six. Those yeah. are yours, but obviously they still have to match, you know, yeah. the other episodes. So, well, you, you, do you yeah, feel like you you're having to, to go copy and... some other people, or how, like how does that? Um, how does how do you approach it? It's just accepting that really. Like uh, one show specifically was Hannibal, and I went in and did uh, the Red Drag Red Dragon episode of Hannibal. But you go into that show knowing full well a very specific style has already been set. And right. yes, we would try and, you know, I would try and like bend the rules a little bit. But if they came back and said, no, no, you can't, these, you know, because like I tried to get a fast dolly shot in there and they said, nope, you can't do that. We have to go Hannibal's Hannibal speed. And in Hannibal <laughs> speed, everything moves slowly. And it's like, okay, we'll go with that. But at the same time, the showrunner came to me and he said, look, you know, what we're doing here is essentially like it's an art house film disguised as a serial killer TV show. Um, so if you have like really wacky ideas and you want to try them out, you know, throw them our way. We'll, we'll give it a go. And so I just came up with like some, some of the most like ridiculous artistic ideas and like threw them at them and they were like, great, let's do it. And then that, that was things like, uh, there's a shot of, uh, Will Graham standing next to a dead body and the room has got all these like red, um, threads all over the place for the bullets uh, for the blood spray pattern thing that they do. I don't know if you've ever seen Dexter, but like yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. over. That. Um, and I said, well, what if they had these like red threads coming out of his back, like dragon wings? Um, and you can only kind of see them as we kind of tilt down. And, and and so they let me do that. And it's a beautiful shot in the thing. And and I said, what if, what if this serial killer, because he likes to watch old movies, what like what if this like film wrapped around his head, and his eye became a projector and was like projecting. Yeah through the film and like his inner thoughts were like on the wall stuff like that and they were like yeah let's do that <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like the craziest stupidest ideas but it kind of all got thrown in there so i mean it's, it's that mix of like some shows like were super um open to you bringing your ideas to the table as long as it conforms to the whole you know you could never go in and like you know reconceive the style of an entire show yeah, yeah. and i guess the dp is also anybody 
the DPs and the grade and, and the, the script, obviously, is keep, and the actors keep everything kind of along a certain wavelength. Because, yeah. you know, as a DP myself, I'm, um, I'm watching a lot of the, the BSC interviews they're doing at the moment, um, you know, similar to what we're doing here. And, and um, I know Sam was, was also on the BSC uh, channel talking about TV shows. And, you know, they have to, they want to have a little bit of input themselves, but then they have to keep the show, you know, the same yeah. sort of, yeah. maybe yeah. the same kind of lighting ratios. It's, you know, it's, simply, kind of it's simply working within a set of rules as opposed yeah. to having no rules at all. But, uh, yeah. yeah, well, that's fine. But you can still bend those rules or you can still find ways to work work within that. It's yeah. fine. And I think the, the but, it, but, but ultimately what it, what it did for me was like, it was, okay, I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I was getting a foot in the pond of the, the TV world. But I think at the end of it, it was like, like okay, what I really want to do is kind of create my own TV shows. Yep. And that's the kind of direction I've gone in now, which is like bringing both that writer director of movies to bear on the television world and thinking, okay, how can I create my own TV stuff? Yeah. Is this when, yeah, Lost in Space is your executive producer. So is this like a, a, a key thing you wanted to be a lot more creatively involved with it from the beginning and helping to... Yeah, well, Lost, Lost in Space was, a, was kind of the first step on that road because I was so heavily involved in the early development yeah. of that. Uh, it's script, you know, a treatment stage and then at script stage, uh, you know, working with the writers and, and things and that involvement. Um, and then kind of went into production and I was like heavily involved in designing the robot and designing the spaceships. And so it, it was very much like doing a feature, but it's still not quite. Yeah. Um, and still there's other, there's other voices. There's, there is a showrunner on the show. So that kind of, you know, who, who outranks me. Um, but still just being a part of it at that level. And I think it just gave me a taste then. I was like, okay, what I really need to do is create my own shows and then take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that answers my previous question, I guess, in terms of how much control, you know, um, I mean, you know, you're a pure filmmaker as it were, you know, you've made features and you, you want that ultimate control. And obviously you have to kind of let you, like you said, let, let go a bit of that at the door when you do episodic stuff. Yeah, if you well, started from scratch. Then. I think all us like writer directors are all a bit greedy for control, and yeah. it's nice. <laughs> I won't say no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also it's also nice to be tempered a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's good to have the voices of people that you trust around you to say, "No, that's too much. That's too little. That needs to be different." You know, want to just give you that alternative and to say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! I think you're getting a bit uh, up your own ass there. So you might want to stop that." And you're going to go, oh, "Yeah, you're right." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> were you um you to be directed quite a few episodes obviously of lost in space as well didn't you i, I only directed the first two the first, the first two, two hours okay yeah yeah was that kind of just for you to kind of just say like this is where i want it to go this is the yeah. the, the feeling um, I want? yeah to set i wanted to set the the, 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 the tone <laughs> and palette and the design the world and all you know, create the world and then let others run with it yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, are you working on? Uh, uh, are you saying about you interested in developing more TV shows? Are you working on one now, then, or involved with another show at the moment? Or uh, I am. I'm developing about four different TV projects at the moment. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, brilliant. And that's early. You know, it's, it's me creating these things with with some fantastic writers and other other uh, producers. It's just like and and you know, we just got to get them out there and you know hopefully touch wood get them picked up. And I, I think yeah, um, you're you're kind of going the route that, well, the world's going really. You know, um, apart from what's happening at the moment, you know, it's it is very much episodic stuff. I mean, like like we were saying earlier, you know, West um, Westworld and Game of Thrones, they've kind of set the bar in terms of the cinematic, you know, quality that you can get to, and uh, yeah. especially with more recent stuff, you know, like like Lost in Space and all, all the Amazon shows and Netflix shows, you know, they're getting to a greater audience. And people just want to sit at home rather than sometimes go into the cinema. Um, and what I th I, yeah, I, th I think that there's, 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 there are no bars anymore. And after, yeah. after those kind of shows, it's like, okay, well, anything's doable on TV. Yeah. One way or another. So, you know. Uh, but that's not, that's not to say that I'm, like, giving up on features because no. that's still my, my first love and, and I still want to still want to make movies. Yeah. Um, so in terms of having worked on sci-fis, horrors, creature features, and all those kind of genres, what, in your opinion, uh, on visual effects, um, it, you know, where does that sort of stand in the modern day kind of TV and filmmaking? I mean, 
you, you know, like you, you mentioned earlier, you know, you kind of grew up watching practical creature costumes like Predator and things like that. Um, but now, you know, we'd, we'd a thing with people wearing gimp suits, you know, <laughs> green gimp yeah. suits, and then you have to kind of put up with that for six months or something. So, like, what's your opinion on that? And do you try to just, do you always try to do as much practical as possible? Because, I mean, I know me and James are big fans of practical stuff, and we, we believe in yeah. that, and I just wanted to get your, your take yeah, on that. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love practical stuff. I will always try and do as much practical as possible. Um, ultimately, I think it always looks looks better it always will stand the test of time i mean you just look back now and see predator you see alien the thing as well uh, yeah yeah and you compare the original alien to like even the most recent alien film with like really bad looking cg aliens jumping oh, around all the place very disappointing. <laughs> and, it, and it looks it looks awful by comparison um you know predator looks amazing you know those the thing looks amazing um those things they you know they look real because they are real yeah and yeah. I think if we if we applied and the problem now is that is that a lot of the you know, the studios or whatever it's like they think oh it's time consuming and they don't want to take the time to do it, but they'll spend the same amount of time in post doing it. You know? And so, getting yeah. more money as well. Probably yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's a, there's a there's a problem that everybody sees VFX as like a just a fix all you know oh let's just do it, do everything in post, and and it just doesn't stand stand up you know. Yeah. Um, you know I was watching recently I watched I Am Legend again. Um, and it's like, yeah, imagine how good that film could would be now yeah. if they'd done practical creatures. If they'd done, it made no know, sense. It made no sense. And those really out awesome looking cartoon CG things running around, which just like say, all yeah. that, all the rest of the film is like so well done, and then they they look god awful. And that's um, the, that's the problem with uh, visual effects as well, isn't it? You know, you cut, if you do it, it for real, it doesn't date. Quickly. It doesn't date. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, um, sorry, yeah. With, with practical, it doesn't date. Whereas visual effects, it will date. You know, but it dates in a weird kind of way because it's like you know the original Jurassic Park, the first Jurassic Park still looks good. I don't know how that works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, There's you know a lot of stuff done since with a lot more money. Yeah, looks terrible. I don't. I, know. I think so. it's, it's because of how you you know like but like so with Jurassic Park, especially in like Terminator Two, I guess and stuff. They were shooting it as if they were shooting it for real. You know, like they still had the their head in and um, how to frame it correctly and stuff. Now yeah. you have got the virtual cameras now, so you can put the camera away like. There's a cameraman up there. That's, that's an impossible shot, but you can do it now. And I think that also sometimes takes you out of it. It does. It definitely takes you out of it. But I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing for me. Is that it's, it's not only just that it looks better in the film, practical stuff looks better in the film, but it's like it's more, it's better on the set as well. It's like if you've got your actors have actually got something to respond to, um, you know, our, our actresses on, on Descent were terrified of the guys playing the crawlers because they were really guys you know they yeah, were there yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know they were slimy and they were disgusting and and you know half naked and they were they were gross so yeah. um that you know that i think that helped with their performances um yeah it's better for me as a director for like framing shots and, and planning around that just to have them in the room be it them or whatever creature it might be it's like uh you know I, I, you just can't be real you can't you can't be reality yeah. Yeah, they, that's what they do on I think so well on Game of Thrones because um, they they had you know people in huge giant outfits and and things like that and you know the people running around with like a lot of you know makeup and prosthetics on and I think it works very well. Yeah, yeah. I mean with because I did the giants on uh, some of the giants on Game of Thrones and it was that thing of we had we had seven foot tall eight foot tall actors yeah. dressed as giants yeah but then we put them against green screen and doubled them in size yeah. again <laughs> yeah. Um, but they had that weight, they had that movement. It looks so much better. But they're real. They're yeah. real guys, yeah. you know, doing real things, and they have all the all the things that go with reality. It's tangible, and uh, and that's that still pays off. Yeah. So yeah, I will always try and fight for doing stuff practically wherever possible. And that's actually, um, I was when I was watching Lost in Space, I was um, I've, I've watched I think for season one, but like um, in terms of the robot, I kept thinking, is that a person in the costume? Is it a robot? I was like, I, I couldn't work it out. So you have to tell me. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a guy in a suit. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's the fantastic uh, Brian Steele um, in a suit that we designed uh, here in LA, and and because it doesn't, I, I was, it doesn't I, look so, like I, one I'm of those things. that we got away with it actually. Because yeah. I, I was waiting for Netflix to come along and say we got to do it CG or something like that. Yeah. But it gives it a humanity that would never have existed if it's CG. I mean, I think there's a couple of shots. I think there's like there's a couple of shots where 
it turns it, it like it grows extra arms. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. For a split second. Yeah, but most of the time when it's on set, whatever, it's just it's it's Brian in that suit, and and he made that part his own, you know, and he brings a performance to it that you wouldn't get. I think it was quite otherwise. cleverly designed because it it doesn't, you know, when like he went obviously you know there's been hundreds of sort of creature features where it looks like a guy in a suit and there's that phrase a guy in a suit whereas yeah. with that robot it, it was designed in a way in my opinion that it doesn't look like there's someone in a suit you know it kind of the shape and you're like how could someone fit in that kind of thing you know it was, we left a couple of like the, uh, in his torso this we left some like little bits of green and they're made transparent so like you can see through them okay so it's just just those little little so that that's when right, you that yeah, that's, that's what CG like. really works because you're like you're using a practical effect, you're enhancing it with CG instead of replacing the whole thing. It does usually work a lot better, I think. And yeah, they did that with Iron well, Man, it, but you know, and then they then they go and CGI the whole bloody thing, you know, in the last few yeah. films. But yeah. that's, it's, it's, it's a bit easier when you're dealing with um, like a, a metal suit or something like that when you're creating, you know, something like that. but when it's something organic, hmm. then it becomes. Problematic. I don't. I don't think you know. They're still struggling to make things that look realistically a living. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I more recently, what was it? That Call of the Wild film with Harrison Ford and that dog. Right. Of yeah. like why they yeah. choose to do a cartoon-looking CG dog, in in what is essentially a very realistic-looking film. Um, I, you know, those kind of decisions baffled me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it a talking dog? Or is it just meant to be a, a real, just normal dog? I haven't seen. It, well, I've only seen the trailer. I think it might talk, maybe. But still, I mean, it's you know, like really talking dogs, yeah. real dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. She's a real dog, otherwise, yeah. if she's not trying to talk or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, it is what yeah. It is. but it's just like I think CG is an incredible tool. Yeah. Yeah. When used, when used well, you know, people like uh, David Fincher and like, yeah, like that, they use CG so well that you don't even know you're seeing it. You know? Yeah, and there's also now, you know, especially it's been made more obvious now of like the Mandalorian, um, you know, with unreal engine and, you know, the backgrounds where you can kind of shoot with your pre-designed backdrops as it were. Yeah, and you just save that. yourself building, you know, hundreds of sets and things like that. I think it's, it's quite amazing. That, what you that can do. Kind of, yeah. That kind of technology is brilliant. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then, and you know, going past, um, I've seen it, you know, where you have it outside a car window, you know, and you'll, th you'll film the road and then you, you don't have to leave the set. And you don't have to yeah. do poor man's process, as it were, and make it look so bad. You know, it does look real because you've got reflections and everything. Yeah, it does the light as well, doesn't it? Bounces yeah. the light. Yeah, yeah if you're dealing with reflective surfaces and things like that, so you get it because it's, uh, yeah, it has a real strong yeah, light to it, well. so it bounces off everything and gets all the reflections that you need. Yeah. That kind of stuff is great. That's yeah. technology you know, use it best. And I love these advances in technology. Not, we can't all afford to... to take advantage of them but no they are quite costly <laughs> yeah um <laughs> and in terms of um i mean I, I i always kind of sometimes ask a director this just so i can understand where they're coming from um but like what i think we've kind of covered it but like what kind of director do you do you think you are um you know you might have heard the phrase you know, are you an actor's director are you a dp's director are you a story director you know like and it's, it's usually like an actor's director is the more common sort of phrase. You know, they, they know how to, they were an actor before or they know how to talk to the actors. But like what kind of director is, are you and what is your approach to sort of things? Um, I think that any director has to be all of those at once. So you have to be a DP director when you're talking to the DP. And you have to be an actor's director when you're talking to the actor. Yeah. And you have to be a different director when you're talking to each actor and each character and each film that you're doing. And... The same with every department. You have to, you know, so you have to know your shit. An yes. overall, overall director. Yeah. Yeah, 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 really. I mean, I mean, that's that's the only thing. I mean, but that's that's, you know, that's that's the director's job is that you've got to have a, you know, you've got to know, all, you know, how to talk to everybody and yeah. inspire everybody and you know, do it that way. Have, have the answers. <laughs> yeah, mostly have the answers. Sometimes it's good to admit that you don't have the answer, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, I do love that process of just being bombarded with questions all the time, like on set. You know, it's it's like that's cool. I like it. Yeah. As long as as long as I've got the answers. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I guess it was. Um, I also meant, I guess, um, you know, in terms of the knowledge that you you know, like I used to do special effects, so I really understand all the things they're doing. You know, that department's doing. You know, and some actors become directors. You know, like Clint Eastwood. 
Um, so yeah. they really understand the actors. What kind of, and obviously you write and direct, but like in terms of uh, your perspective, are you, do you really understand sometimes, you know, all the technical stuff, say, of the cameras and what the DP does? And what do you, you kind of just try and spread that knowledge throughout, like you were just saying? I think so. I mean, like, I love doing action stuff. I love doing with practical effects stuff. I love doing um, great drama and things. Uh, I, I, there's, there's a lot of, you know, I, there's not much of it I don't love. Um, I try and keep up with the technology. Um, it's it's advancing all the time. I don't, I don't claim to know everything about cameras and lenses and such like because, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a DP to do, do that. That's yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> so... I don't feel that I, need, I should I should try and be an expert on every department, but an understanding of it and an appreciation of that of every department. Um, but yeah, the, the hardest part is like keeping up with the technology because it's changing all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, you just you just do your best, don't you? Yeah. So what's yeah. next for you then? Have you got you got um, a film at the moment in post production? Have you got another film planned for the future or? Yes, uh, well, several, um, but the main, you know, at the moment we're just doing post production on the reckoning, um, which um, we shot in Budapest uh, last summer, and um, yeah, out in Hungary last summer, and uh, yeah, so we're just doing the finishing touches on that now. And what then, is that um, about for people that haven't heard about it yet? It's set in seventeenth uh, century England, um, and it's about a witch hunt. Well, specifically about a woman who is falsely accused of being a witch and uh, undergoes the trials uh, by, by this um, dedicated witch hunter, this guy, uh, this terrifying guy, um, and ultimately how she will turn the tables and get her revenge on them. Um, it's so it's, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, what we've come out with is, is, I don't know, I mean, I think it's, think it's very prescient. I think it's very much of the time. Not only does it deal, it's set during 1665, which is the year of the Great Plague, ironically um and uh yeah and, and the concept of witch hunts is still very much with us um so you know we wanted to tell this interesting story it was it was, it was i wrote it i co-wrote it with um charlotte kirk who plays the the lead in it um which is an amazing job after you know i i do have a bit of a habit you know talking about uh, actors director or whatever but i do have a bit of a habit of like putting through my actors through hell on films, uh, on, for everything from Dog Soldiers to Cent Centurion, we had actors with frostbite and hypothermia and God knows what. Um, and in this one, you know, um, Charlotte undergoes uh, the, you know, these, tor these all these torture devices and being constantly doused in freezing cold water and stuff like that. It's kind of miserable, but yeah, she was a real trooper um, and and just gave this astonishing performance. So very very proud of that. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a return to horror for me as well. I've no, I haven't done a horror film in a long time, so um, it was a big, big return to that. And then, is it nice you know, going, next up, going back and doing doing those things where you see it from start to finish, all the way through? And it was, like, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. Refreshing. It has, it has been a long journey, but it's been a, you know, ultimately been a, and it's been a difficult journey, but and sometimes painful, but very satisfying at the end because what's come out of it is something that we can all be very, very proud of. Um, Amazing. And that, that's that's. That's a big. That's a big thing. And next up, where we've co-written and we're going to do a um, a gangster movie because I always fancy doing a gangster movie. Okay. So. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, with with, uh, with a, like a twist on it, maybe. I mean, don't go into details, but like a slight twist on the maybe story. Maybe some uh, vampires or. No. <laughs> uh, nothing <laughs> nothing like that. Nothing supernatural. There's definitely <laughs> a twist involved, but nothing supernatural. Okay. No, yeah. but lots okay. of gratuitous sex and violence. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I don't think it'd be your film without that, or some kind of <laughs> <laughs> some kind of violence anyway. Um, uh, yeah, well, it's all part of the action thing. I do, I, I do love splashing blood around the set. I do. Yeah. I get carried away with it. What's um? What kind of? I mean, we're obviously trying to educate people in this downtime, um, as well as interviewing, you know, directors and DPs and the such. Um, what kind of? I don't know. What lessons have you learned? over the years really um and what advice might you give you know young writing directors upcoming yeah writer directors yeah. um well you know at the moment there's there's a few things I mean, the, the broadest lessons are you know be be stubborn and determined to get where you're going to be you know believe in it that it's going to happen uh, be patient as well that's the big thing anybody who's going to work on set you've got to be patient because it's slow 
I think like there's a lot of waiting around in one form or another, either trying to get things made, getting things made, trying to get things seen. So there's a lot of things move very slowly sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Filmmaking in general, and be it film or TV, tends to involve lots of waiting around interspersed with moments of intense excitement. And yeah. that, that's like on set, that's like the build up. It's like that, that's, that's filmmaking, I think. Um, and so you've got to have that patience. I also think at the moment that you know the, the, there's a blurred, there's a very blurred line between film and TV, and I think that's probably a good thing. It's yeah. like you you can't have a an ego about you know film and TV like because it used to be like you know there was film and there was yeah. theater and there was TV was down here because like the TV <laughs> was like to be frowned upon. That's not the thing anymore now. It's like most people who I know who work in film all want to work in TV, and that's the place to be. Um, so. And everything's on equal footing, and I think that's good. So it's broadened everybody's horizons a bit. I always remember when Twenty Four came on, and you know, Kiefer Sutherland was the lead, and I was like, "This TV series looks amazing." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was. It was great. <laughs> but yeah, but, but so many like everybody wanting to get into television yeah. now. So yeah, um, well, that's what advice I'd give for really. you. You know, I think you know, when I was making Dog Soldiers, and it, you know, if I'd known it was going to take six years, would I have? looked upon it any differently i don't think so i think I, I, as i as soon as i conceived with the idea i couldn't foresee any version where i wouldn't get it made mm. um and just stuck to that and it happened to take six years for some people it takes longer for some people it takes less but um i think it's just it's just that belief that one day it's gonna happen if you believe in it enough yeah yeah you know, I think and get verification, you know, go talk to people, talk to your friends, talk to whatever, like get verification that this dream that you're chasing isn't a waste of time. That, isn't. that you're actually good, yeah. Yeah, that is <laughs> dog shit that you're going after. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's bad well, advice because there's, it matters. there's quite a few people who, you know, they want to be Scorsese or whatever or yourself and it's just, they, they, no, you know, no one's being honest with them. And I think sometimes yeah. you have to be... I do it my, with myself all the time. You know, I watch my own, own stuff back. And I'm like, that was crap. You know, I can do better than that. You know, and, yeah. or, and I, I think I, everyone I, needs to do that. Uh, everyone needs to do that. And, yeah, and you grow definitely. on every project, I think. Yeah, I, I, you know, I encourage everybody to, to fail miserably at, at some point in order to learn. You're going to learn so much more from that than you're ever going to learn from, like, succeeding. Yeah, it's very true, yeah. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, it's been a genuine pleasure. Hope, hope that was of use. Absolutely, yeah, was, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. It was great chatting with you. I think, I think we, we haven't had any yeah, questions, but I think we've, we've covered so much. Um, yeah. So, oh, sorry, I tend to waffle on a bit. No, no, it was That's, perfect. It was perfect. It was we've had just exactly lots of people cool. saying Centurion was awesome. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Where's the sequel? Yeah, where's Dog Soldiers, <laughs> the this, this series? <laughs> to the Reckoning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think the, uh, the, yeah, it's the question I probably get most asked, asked most often is, you know, Dog, you know, Dog Soldiers 2, will that ever happen? Yeah, and, yeah. and the answer is, I would love for it to happen, but I don't own the rights to the movie, so oh, right. I can't yeah. just make it myself. So yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. working on it. We have yeah, been yeah. working on it. Maybe it'll happen one day. Yeah, yeah. Who didn't, knows? Didn't, didn't a poster pop up for it like years ago, I think? Years ago, yeah, yeah. Really? But that was oh, right. that was the yeah, spinach but... guy. He went off to try and do it himself. And uh, <laughs> and the yeah. descent too was I'd... that was was that to do with you or, or again not not the rights and stuff? No, not really. It was um, I th you know, I've got a Sam worked on that. I, I, yeah, he did. They got like a, the entire kind of crew back to do it again, but I, it was like for me, it was like it doesn't warrant a sequel. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like a bit of a cash grab. It did, yeah. So. I think a little bit. <laughs> it did sort of retread the same ground, didn't a little it? Bit. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there was too much light in the caves. <laughs> yeah. A bit like the Hobbit, where you have up lights uh, up, in the cave yeah. that exactly. James keeps telling me bright. about. You know. Bright. Why, yeah. why are there up lights, up party lights in a cave with a dragon? Who knows? Um, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things, like you're saying about lighting. I, I can't stand it in films where, you know, it's the typical, though, when they go in with their torch, but it's so well lit, you can see everything. But they're yeah. squinting with their torch. It's like, well, you can see there's stuff in there. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. I knew we were taking a risk with that, I understand, but it paid off. But, yeah, yeah, when, yeah. You, when, you, when you compare it to other cave movies, it's kind of like, oh, wow, where's that light coming from? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, 
Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we'll be back next yes. week. I, we have thanks for watching. Yeah, we have PJ Dillon, the DOP behind Altered Carbon, Vikings, uh, a brilliant Irish cinematographer. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye bye. See you guys. Bye bye.